Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Vince Molinaro, and welcome to this episode of the Lead the Future podcast. I'm really excited to have Jim Reed as our guest uh, today. Uh, Jim is an author, speaker, and coach, and he's an accomplished executive who has navigated significant change and organizational transformations uh, over his career. He has been the uh, you know, strategic trusted advisor to seven CEOs, and has been recognized by the Globe and Mail's report on business as one of Canada's 50 best executives in 2021. Most recently, Jim has really synthesized uh, his decades of leadership experience, both as a senior executive uh, in the C-suite, but also in building uh, leadership leaders across their, the organizations he's worked in his book, uh, Lead to Greatness. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, it is jam-packed with insights to not only help you individually as a leader, but how to develop your team and ultimately bring his principles across an organization. Uh, Jim is a leader who I've known for a number of years and I've always respected uh, his approach to business and leadership and culture. So I'm really excited to have you, Jim. Welcome. And thanks for making time to join us today on the Lead the Future podcast. Oh, it's just such a pleasure to be here, Vince. Thanks for having me. So let's uh, dive right in. Uh, you, you begin uh, the book in a, in a provocative way where you say, you know, as, you, as leaders are always looking for a leg up, right? It's, it's, a, it's a job of high expectations. But when you looked at, you know, um, kind of the leadership industry and all the leadership theories that are out there, it's a struggle for leaders because some of that advice is contradictory. And you also say that in your experience, it lacks real world application. So, you know, what's your sense uh, of where, what is the state of the leadership development industry today? Well, I mean, it, you know, for me, all my life, I've had this, you know, passion for building leaders and teams and culture. And um, as a result of that, as you mentioned in the, in, in the intro, you know, I've coached hundreds of leaders, including um, seven CEOs. And one of the things that they've always said to me when you're coaching them is, you know, Jim, keep it simple. It's got to be really simple for me. There's so much information out there. Pressure's high. I need to deliver. So the biggest thing that they asked for for me was simplicity. And so that took me to find things that were timeless, uh, focus on principles, which I kind of learned from the work that I did working with Jim Collins on the good to great research and then how the mighty fall and great by choice is to get these timeless principles that if people understand and live every day, it's going to get them to a better place. So it was really a strive for simplicity and letting people, you know, pick a model for leadership that, that, that they can live in their whole life, not just their work life, and then get the kind of authenticity and, and consistency that the best leaders are always looking for. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, it's a big part of kind of an underlying theme, right? It's, it's who we are as people is who we are as leaders and, and, and speak, speak to that in terms of that, you know, I don't think we can separate that, th those two things out. What's been your experience there? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, it, I think we are who we are, you know, and I think a big part of, of life is getting clarity on the kinds of things that are really going to matter in your life. You know, what your values are, what your purpose in life is, why are you there and what kind of difference do you want to make? You know, discovering early as you can in your career, you know, what your deep strengths are, not what you're good at, but what you're better at, what, what you can be best at. And playing to those consistently, that's your best path for success. So I think I think figuring it out from a whole life perspective allows you just to be the best version of yourself. Yeah. And that's kind of what, you know, the people I coached have taught me. And that's what I tried to build in the book, the step-by-step -step guide for anybody who wants to take their leadership to the next level. Yeah, so let's get into those steps. You know, you you outline uh, really nicely and simply, uh, you know, plus five leadership uh, development model with five, you know, really applicable uh, principles. Why, why don't we spend a bit of time kind of talking about, about about each of those? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, I mean, the first the first principle for me is is clarity of personal values and uh, and, and your life's purpose. And you know, I came to this when I was attending a an organizational program, an organizational course at Stanford University uh, was on uh, on change. 
And on the faculty there was Jim Collins. It was the first time I met him. And after class one day, he asked me a question. He said, Jim, why are you here? I said at the time I was running a business and the business model had been turned on its side. And I was trying to figure out what to change in order to keep the business successful. And he stopped me and he said, Jim, that's the wrong question. And he explained to me that from the built to last research, which he and Jerry Porras published, the built to last companies who outperformed their comparison companies by seven to one over decades. So it wasn't luck. The first question they asked when faced with change was what not to change. And I began to realize that that principle applies to building great companies, but it also applies to building a great life. So for me, principle one are the things that should never change in your life, your values uh, and your purpose. The values are the what and the purpose is the why. Yeah. And that becomes your foundation in life. What you build your whole life on and your whole leadership on, and it sets the stage for the decisions that you make and sets you up for, the, for when your values get tested. And of course, they always get tested during the tough times, not the easy times. So that's principle one. And can you, as a result of that, you know, I, I'm sure you can kind of spot leaders uh, when they don't have this figured out and don't have that that core. Uh, and I suspect that's kind of what you you can kind of sniff out and, and try to help them with, I, I would assume, right? I think that's exactly it. I would say the best leaders have, when you ask them, when I'm coaching them and I say, you know, talk to me about your values, your personal values. And have you thought about your life's purpose? They give it back to me, Vince, in like 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear that they've done the work. They understand what they stand for and what they believe in. And they understand also kind of what kind of difference they want to make. And I think if you have that, if you're not clear on it, or you're sort of clear on it and or fuzzy on it, what happens when you make decisions is you're not consistent. And so you, you end up in the team environment or an organizational environment just not having that kind of consistency and steadiness yeah. that the best leaders always demonstrate. Yeah. yeah, we talked about that years back when I interviewed you for an article, right? And, and, and for yourself, you talked about that being critical and, and having to deal with a lot of change and, um, totally. you know, in, in your in your own uh, life as a, as a business leader. So we, we can spend a whole discussion just on yeah. this. There's yeah. more. So let's, let's go on to the next uh, principle. Well, the, uh, the, the second principle is around playing to your strengths and your passion always. And, and uh, you know, the, the book really tries to bring together the best research on high performance coupled with, you know, over 30 years of observing what the best leaders do differently. And one of the great um, practical tools that came out of the good to great research was the three circles framework, which Jim Collins referred to as the hedgehog concept. This is like the best strategy framework for companies. And the goal is get to the intersection of the three circles. The circle one is, you know, what does your, what are your genetically encoded strengths? Circle two is what are you passionate about? And circle three is what drives your economic engine. But again, for me as a leadership practitioner working with Jim, I'm always thinking about how does this apply, not at the company level, although I'm interested in that, but how does it apply at the individual level? And it does. So what I've, what I've noticed in the best executives is they have this, they discover very early on in their career what their inside out strengths are, not what you're good at. It's a higher test. It's what, what can you be differentiated around? Second, on the passion side, when they get up in the morning, they love what they do. It's, and it's passion beyond family and friends. It's about the kind of work that you want to do. What's the expression? I think it says, you never have to work a day in your life if you love what you do. Um, so, and then the third circle is make a living, which is really more relevant only during career change. But for most executives, what I try to coach them to do is to discover early on, look at their best successes, and then what strengths did they draw on and what kind of work do they love to do? And that then becomes the best path for personal success. Yeah, I love I love when that was in in the book because you know the hedgehog model is one I've yep. used. Uh, my teams will say it's always been in the foundation to start the strategy process, but also uh, what's powerful about it, and and I, I think you you expand on that work. Um, you know, not only is it powerful for an organization, then you connect the personal to that, and and that becomes uh, really powerful when the kind of the strategic and business is connected to the personal. Uh, and and I really like how you did that. So let's totally keep going. Number three. A lot, yeah, a lot of people too, Vince. Before I moved to three, yeah. you know, they're they're kind of winging it, right? Like they're they have sort of clarity on strengths, but 
but you, if you want to, if you want to be great, you have to have crystal clarity yeah. and, and play to them always. And some of the best executives are always successful because they never take on work that doesn't play to their strengths or their passion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So number That's three cool. is um, around the right people. And you and I have talked about this many, many times over the course of our careers. You know, I, I, what I see the, the best leaders do is that they understand that the most important choices they're going to make in their life are around people. And it's, it's who are the right people in their life. You know, their, 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 their partners, their, their friends, the people that they want to bring on their team. And you can see how these build on each other, you know, by having clarity of values and purpose, that, that, that's your foundation. Then by having clarity on, on deep strengths and passion, now you can understand using the two of those who the right people for you are. And what I like to challenge leaders to do is to make making the right people decisions one of their signature qualities as a leader. And so people are not your biggest constraint. You're right. The right people are. And it's all about fit, fit with the values of the organization or of you as a leader, inspired by the purpose, team players, work ethic, um, positivity, willingness to grow. These are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. And remember that up to some point in your career, your success is dependent on just you. Yeah. But after a certain point, your success is dependent on the strength and the quality of the team that you build. Yeah. So the right yeah. people decisions is, is a huge differentiator in terms of uh, executive performance. Yeah. And what I saw really nicely laid out was the connection between the second principle on, on really, you know, honing in on your strengths and having, you know, the right and making the right people decisions. Because if you are, you know, if you know what your sweet spot is and you are, you know where your value is personally, then you have no fear bringing in really, really strong people who compliment you. It's and, so true. And I, so and I true. think sometimes if I, I've seen some leaders who may not be as, uh, as clear internally or of their own strengths, sometimes they, they, you know, should I bring this person on? They might be stronger than me, uh, which, you know, my, my, my personal take was always great. The, the stronger, the better. Uh, uh, because I, I know of my strengths and I know of my gaps, uh, and there's many of those, uh, but I, I need the strongest people to, to help us be successful. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, but that's the connection I made as I, I read those two uh, principles and how they work together. Oh, you're so bang on. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we use this word clarity a few times in our conversation today and, and having clarity on values and purpose and strengths and passion just, just frees you up yeah. to bring in the absolute best talent you have and and you know it's a tough it's a tough competitive world out there and and, and you know the the team is really the performance unit in the company yeah. and so the stronger the more capable you can make your team the more success the team will have the more success individuals and the team will have the more success you as a leader will have yeah so let's keep going um you know we've got this sense of now we're going to number four uh, yeah. and talk to us about that and and how they connect, because I think that's what's great about the five principles that they really, as you say, do build on each other. Yeah. So once you once you have um, you know the right people on the bus, so to speak, and the wrong people off the bus, you know the next thing to do is is really how do you how do you uh, how do you build engagement? And there's two dimensions to this. The first dimension of engagement is is, is making sure that you as a leader are engaged. Um, yourself, because you can't expect your team to be engaged if you don't set that tone around engagement. So that's the first thing. And I, in my coaching with a lot of executives, what I try to do with them is teach them about how critical it is around to manage energy. And it's all about engagement, personal, personal engagement is all about, you know, making sure that you manage energy to be at your peak performance when you need to be at your peak performance. You know, there's that old adage that life is a marathon you know, you have to pace yourself. And that's not what I see the high performers do. They look at it differently. They, they see life as a series of sprints followed by recovery. So they're very good at driving hard when they need to drive hard. That expends a lot of energy and then they recover. They rebuild their energy reserves by staying healthy, staying fit, by getting good night's sleep, by rituals which allow them to be at their best when they need to be at their best. So that's one side of engagement for leaders. The other side is, you know, I think as a to be the best leader, you have to learn and become very skilled at how to build a high performance team. 
And so you need a model for a high performance team. In the book, I describe one that I've used in my coaching. Uh, Lencioni has a great model. Vince, you've done some really great work around accountability and, and team models, which are very, very powerful for leaders. What I say to leaders is pick a model you're comfortable with and then learn it, master it, and then use it, right? And make your team stronger every six months than it is today. And so the other, the other dimension of engagement that I've learned in coaching is that, that often when you look at the analytics around engagement as, as sort of a, the fuel for performance, people, the number one driver is often around personal growth and development. So you have to become exceptionally good at coaching and developing individuals on your team and building your team in order to drive sustainable performance over time. So that's what principle four is all about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's great about the principle is as you, as you start, you know, as you, as you stated is helping leaders understand. Uh, and I think some, uh, in my experience, underestimate how important the tone they set personally is, you know, uh, our, our global research revealed, you know, sort of five characteristics of, you know, what we call kind of accountable leaders. And one of them is, is, you know, demonstrating optimism and being excited about the future. And, you know, if you have a leader who isn't optimistic or isn't excited about the future, your team feeds off of that versus, uh, you know, optimism, positivity, a can do kind of attitude. And, and to me, that's tied directly to some of the themes you, 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 you talk about. Oh, it's just so, so true. And, you know, we all know uh, a great leader when we've seen, see one or when, where we've been led by one. Yeah. And one of the beautiful things about life is you can learn from the best of the best and you can learn from those who aren't the best. Yeah. And this tone that you're talking about that leaders set in a team environment is hugely powerful, right? And so, and, and often leaders forget uh, and, they, and they don't have the consistency around the tone, which is why the, you know, getting clarity on values and purpose are so, so key in terms of the kind of difference you want to make in your life. But yeah, it's huge. Yeah. It's just a huge determinant of success. Yeah. So let's go to the, the, the last principle, because uh, it's all about discipline and uh, yeah. lo love that. So let's dive into that and, and tell us your thinking on, on that point. Yeah, like I, I, Vince, you know, earlier in my career, I was a, I was a military pilot. So, you know, every once in a while I use, uh, I use military metaphors and things. But the discipline is about, there's two dimensions to it. The first dimension is self-discipline. And um, I think you, you've done some great work in this area as well around the discipline around being, being, being accountable, you know, as, as a leader, which is so fundamentally important. But I think discipline, self-discipline kind of allows the leader to kick it into a higher gear. It allows you to kind of put the throttle into afterburner and really leverage the other four principles. So in the book, I describe, you know, some of the behaviors that are you know, indicative of the best leaders, you know, they're builders, they're not dividers, you know, that the empathy that they bring in their leadership, the, um, the grit they have, the mission focus they have, and, and the expertise in communications, you know, are, are some of the things that disciplined leaders have, 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 have built deep skills around. So there's that piece. The other piece comes back to team. And, you know, what I try to communicate in the book is that, you know, the, the culture is really the execution engine of the company. And what I believe after being in companies for a long time is that you change, you can change culture one team at a time. And so, you know, becoming very um, knowledgeable about cu culture, being the way that work gets done and, you know, recognizing that your culture gets defined by the worst behavior you're, you're, you're going to tolerate. Yeah. And really driving out the bad behaviors and, and rewarding and emphasizing the kinds of behaviors that allow the team to, to accomplish extraordinary things over the long term. So, yeah. so that discipline for me is, is the higher gear, right? It's the afterburner of performance and, and that the best of the best draw. Yeah. And you can, and like you can sense it right away, right? You can, yeah. you can just sense it. Anytime uh, you interact with a leader, uh, the discipline they have, the responsiveness they demonstrate, and you quickly get a sense of who they are and what it's going to be like to kind of work with them. Uh, and then those who may not be as disciplined look maybe somewhat erratic, and that gives you a completely different impression, which typically, you know, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't favorable. Uh, I, I love the line you know, what you just said around, you know, you change culture sort of one, one team at a, at a time. And, and certainly you, 
you know, not only have set the tone as a strong senior C-suite leader, but you've also, you know, built strong leadership cultures. And and what have you learned is is sort of critical in, in doing that? Um, well, I think at the cultural level, you know, I, I think to build a high-performing culture and, and, you know, one of the things that that um, I did some work with Dave Ulrich. Um, he's a very uh, knowledgeable, insightful person. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he taught me was that, you know, we were talking about keeping it simple and the role of the leader in a, at a high level is to do two things, drive value to customers and shape and build a, a high performance culture. And so I've always believed that because it's simple and it's easy to understand and it, it allows the, the, the allows the leader to focus. But I think it starts with the right people, right? And and when you have the right people in your organization, you know, there's a there's an, an old adage that says, you know, if you get the right people on your team, and the best direct reports never have to be managed. Yeah, you know, they they see their roles as um, a responsibility, not as a job. And so when you get the right people on board, you have such an opportunity to build something special, and uh, you have alignment on values. And, and, and you have people with the right strengths and by having alignment on values, it allows you to, to really have more discussion and debate. It's not people think people think the same. They don't. But but alignment on values start, allows you to start with a handshake and, and, and a, a point of commonality. Yeah. And that allows the kind of debate that you need to have um, in order to make the right business decisions. Yeah. There is an element I'd be curious in terms of your perspective. I mean, getting the right people on board kind of get that. But sometimes uh, I'd love to get your your take on this. Uh, one of the things we we see in our, our work is leaders, when they recognize that they may not have made the right hire or the individual we thought was the right hire on paper, but hasn't played out as we would have hoped, uh, struggle in taking action. And uh, you know, we just spoke to a senior leader who who talked about a performance issue that's been going on for three years. And and I hear that, and I go, how how have you let this go on this long? A, you're not doing your job for the company. B, you're not doing you're not being fair to that person. Uh, what's been your take on that? Because I think that's the other side of that coin, right? Getting the right people, and as Colin says, uh, the, the people that have to get off the bus sometimes have to get off the bus or move to different roles. Yeah, and I think you know when we talk about the right people principle, it's be, making it your signature quality. You have to you have to operate on both dimensions. You know, you have to get the right people on, as you said, and the wrong people off. I would say that of all every CEO that I work with, and almost every top performing executive I've worked with has told me that they had just like you described, Vince. They had people decisions that they were sitting on, and they sat on them for too long. And you, you have to understand when, when you have somebody on your team that's not performing, it puts huge pressure, not just on you and your success, but on your, on your teammate success, success, like they're having to pick up the load and, and ha- having the wrong person on the, on the team can drains the energy from people. And usually when people aren't performing, they know they're not performing. So what I try to coach leaders around is, is I say, take Take the amount of time that you need to make a decision about whether you're going to keep the person and develop them or move them out. But once you decide, act. Yeah. And so many people make a decision to make a change and then they sit on it for months and months and months and often to their own peril and certainly to the functioning of the team's peril. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the, you know, one of the things you've been able to do and, and you talk about it, right. Being a trusted advisor, to not just one CEO, but seven of them. And I know in working with other heads of human resources that that's always kind of the ambition or the end goal to get that kind of positioning and being seen that way. Uh, but also not everyone kind of gets there. And and sort of what, what's your, given your principles and whatnot, what have you learned? How have you done it? Uh, uh, to do it once is, is awesome. To do it seven times is extraordinary. And, and what would be your advice as senior HR leaders out there? I remember, um, you know, my wife, Patty, when, uh, when I was at Rogers and, and, uh, and Guy Lawrence, um, you know, the decision was made for Guy to leave. And, and at that time, Joe Natale came in, but 
Patty sent me an email and she said, Jim, it was sort of like pack your bags. The head of HR is always the first to go type of thing, right? So yeah, I've, 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 I've survived and learned along the way. But I would say a couple of things for me that were, that were important that kind of guided my sort of behaviors and kind of my focus. The first is, um, you know, in a trusted advisor role or a CTRO role, when you're working with the top executive, it's lonely at the top, right? And so you have to become very skilled at building trust. Like trust is really the oxygen you breathe in a, in a, in a high stakes um, relationship when you're supporting, you know, a chief executive officer or other C-suite executives, you have to build trust. And, and what does that mean? It means you have to have their back, right? You have to, you have to have their back. You have to look at the world through their lens, not your lens, like from a business perspective and understand kind of the landscape that they're stepping into and the kinds of issues that they have to deal with. And, and, and third, I, I think you, you know, you really, you really have to speak the truth. You know, you, you, you can't sugarcoat it. You have like they count on you to, you know, speak the truth to them about what's working and what's not working and help them figure out solutions. It's not that I needed to know, right? I never really needed to know what the answer were. What I needed to do was to ask the right questions to help them figure out what the right path is and to be strongly committed to that path. Yeah. So I think those are the big ones, Vince, for me that, you know, look, look through their lens, trust and, uh, and, and speak the truth. So um, two other areas I want to get your perspective on before we close out. But uh, the next one is, you know, you have a chapter on crisis leadership, which is, yeah. which is really compelling. And I know you've you've been there as well. A lot of leaders have over the last two years, obviously, given everything we've gone through. But as you look out, you know, over the next year or so, what what really will organizations really need from their leaders to navigate this next phase of whatever we're going through? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was such an extraordinary time, you know, who would have thought when we started, you know, you and I talked a couple of times during the pandemic and, you know, every, I think we all thought we went into it, it would be over, you know, in six months, you know, we'd be moving on. Of course, it, that wasn't the case. And in a crisis, there's no playbook. It's decision by decision. And, and one of the good things about the crisis, I think, is that the leaders who really um, excelled in the crisis, you know, they did two or three things differently. One, they showed great empathy for their teams and um, you know, or leaders always want their team members, like their employees to care about the company. Well, they're not going to care about the company unless the leaders care about them. Yeah. So that's the first thing I think that, you know, going forward, the lessons we should take forward with us is you have to, you have to care about your, your people like deeply care. And if you do, they'll give it back to you 10 times over. And so that's the first thing, much more empathetic, uh, caring leadership. And that doesn't mean being soft on results, right? It just, because yeah. you can do both. Yeah. I think the second thing is, um, you know, the best leaders in the pandemic were, they understood that it was fewer, bigger priorities, like keep it simple, right? And often uh, that was the greatest thing about the crisis, you know, that, that when things are, are happening fast and people are afraid, you have to keep it simple. So fewer, bigger priorities, I think, is a is is one of the prerequisites for high performance and focus, and in a world that makes it hard to focus. And the final one is, you know, just you know, it, it's storytelling. You know, making making it safe for people to go on the journey with you as a leader, like just you know, because people won't go with you if they don't if they don't feel that it's safe to go to go on to go on the trip. You know, and so. Again, the best leaders are empathetic. They're great storytellers, and and they and they and their priorities are you know the the, the big priorities, not all priorities. Okay, last question. It's one we ask all the guests of our podcast, and it's really you know kind of synthesizing your words of wisdom, your words of wisdom for young leaders. There's you know new graduates entering the workplace. They've had a tough couple of years. Um, there's people that have been in the work in the workplace for. A few years, some are just starting maybe their first people leadership role with a small team. Uh, what what uh, what have you learned, and what would be of value to them to learn about how they can be the best leaders po possible? Yeah, so I I, I always feel that um, when I'm providing you know career coaching to people that in their, especially people who are younger in their or earlier in their careers, I always say early in your career pick the company. Uh, pick a company that fits with your values and and that you're inspired by what they're doing in terms of their purpose. 
Um, so, and pick a growth company because growth means opportunity for you. So early in your career, pick, pick a company, a growth company that aligns to your values and your purpose. Later in your career, pick the manager. You always want to work mid-career for top talent. Why? Because um, they have a track record for success. They're going to push you. They're going to help you build capacity and capability, and they're going to get behind you in your development. They understand how important development is, and you're going to learn more from them and be more challenged by working for top talent mid-career and beyond. And then, you know, I'd say, you know, we, we use this word, I use this word a lot when I'm coaching. It's, it's, you have to get clarity. Like the earlier you get clarity around some of the principles we're talking about early in your career, yeah. it, it might not, and it's the small things, Vince, you know, that make the big difference. And it's, and it's about momentum and recognizing that high performance is a personal choice. But the sooner you get clarity, you, you change your trajectory immediately. Yeah. And a one or two degree change when you're in your 20s means you're going to end up in a completely different place in your 40s and 50s. So, and you just have to go for it, right? Like, you know, I see a lot of people sitting back on their coattails and they just don't have the confidence, but you just have to, you know, hit the gas pedal and go for it. Yeah. And and I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, particularly when I look at, you know, Gen, Gen Z or Gen Z, um, you know, sure. because I think that's a generation that has had to think about the construct of leadership really early in their lives and have already had a lot of experiences. And many times, you know, if they've had to apply to college or university, they've had to have a supplementary application to prove that they had leadership experience. Uh, I never had to do that. I don't know about you, but yeah, um, no. <laughs> and so I think that is uh, where I, I derive a lot of hope because they're already coming prime. And I hope that they're going to to your challenge, uh, you know, just uh, step up and and help us uh, lead our the organizations uh, uh, because we need them to. Yeah, exactly. And uh, listen, they're very talented, very passionate generation. And if you're as a leader today, you just have to look to that generation in terms of what they want to understand how you need to show up as a leader, right? Yeah. And, you know. Well, Jim, I, I want to thank you for your uh, your wisdom. Uh, as always, uh, uh, I really appreciate how thoughtful you are, but also that ability to make things simple. And, and I can really see how the ideas can move to translation into action immediately it is not easy to do, and you've done it. So congratulations on the book um, and as you enter this next phase of your career. And thank you again for uh, joining us today on the Lead the Future podcast. Thanks so much. And Vince, thank you for all you've done to contribute to the leadership thought and also for being a, a friend and a supporter to me along the way as well. It's been, it's been great to get to know you. Great. Thank you.